Welcome, welcome to the Heads Together podcast. I'm your host, Joe Mokes, and this week I am bloody thrilled to be joined by the absolutely fabulous Eduardo Placer. Eduardo is just, oh my goodness, I've, I've only spoken to him once before and he captivated me. I mean, seriously captivated me. He is the CEO and founder of Fearless Communicators, which is, he's based in New York. His company help speakers know what to say and how to say it, I think is how he phrases it, which I just love. But he's also a keynote speaker in his own right. He's a social entrepreneur and a global community builder. His client list is, it it sparkles, trust me. It is a very impressive list of people that he has worked with. And I am not surprised. Eduardo was a professional actor for 15 years who worked all over the States, all over the world, actually. Um, he's traveled with his work and his acting. And he's just, ah, you're going to find out, he is just a delight. Uh, we have a great conversation in this episode, all about harnessing the power of presence. So, Eduardo really generously shares with us in this episode his his mantra, really, that applies to every client he works with when it comes to getting the best out of them in terms of public speaking. So if giving a talk is on your radar, if you would love to have a keynote speech as one of your offers, even if just the thought of public speaking scares you and you really want to dial that down and embrace being a little more authentic when you are talking to a group, then this episode is for you because Eduardo really brings this to life for us. And yeah, I think you're going to love him as much as I do. So let's dive in. Welcome, welcome to the Heads Together podcast. I'm Jill Mokes, and I am obsessed with cutting through the noise when it comes to growing your business. Each week, via intimate coaching conversations and inspirational stories, I share what it really takes to get the results you want in a way that feels right to you. I am all about attracting higher ticket opportunities, building authentic relationships, and creating the abundant, full fat version of your dream business. I mean, how many of us have beavered away creating a light version of what we really want? The thing is, I honestly believe when you're outstanding at what you do, there is no limit to what you can achieve. So, are you ready to put our heads together and make it happen? Let's go. Eduardo, welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me. And there was a really, like, the reason I'm uber excited to have you join me is that we had such a powerful conversation together, didn't we, in private. And I suddenly thought, oh, I actually wish we'd had this entire conversation on the podcast because I I feel like it would be selfish to keep you to myself. I need to share you. So um, thank you so much. Will you just, for everyone listening, tell us a little bit about who you are and your business? Sure. So my name is Eduardo Placer. I use he, him pronouns. And when I talk about my work as a public speaking coach, I always begin with second grade and show and tell, clutching a stuffed animal seal. (laughs) And I'm staring at my classmates and I'm saying something magical like seals are mammals. They live in the water. They eat fish. Sometimes they're eaten by sharks. And I thought that I crushed it. Beautiful. And then when I looked at my classmates, there were 12, but it felt like 50. They weren't interested. (laughs) And then I uttered, I don't know what, (laughs) I was moved by the spirit to say, I named him after Brett MacGyver. (laughs) who was the blonde popular boy that I had a crush on in second grade in Miami, Florida in 1986. I'm talking about truth bombs, Jill. <laughs> truth bombs. Actually priceless. <laughs> and, yeah. And it was the first time that I felt unsafe. I literally took a tear in that moment. 
And it's something that I've had to reconcile ever since. And I think that many people in their life turn their healing into their work. And for me, the opportunity to be free in front of an audience, being fully seen as I am without having to edit or excuse or pretend is a liberation, has been like the liberation of my journey in life. And I think a lot of people are hungry for it. Yeah, so many people are hungry for that. And for so many people, it's so bloody elusive. I think there are so many people who want it. And this isn't even, is it, about getting up on a big stage in front of a huge number of people. This isn't just about that. This is about being comfortable just speaking as yourself, authentically as yourself to anyone, right? Yeah. And I say there's no such thing as private speaking. So sometimes people will think public speaking is having to give a big presentation or 300 or 400 people or 1,000 people or 5,000 people. But this is public speaking. Yeah. One, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> you know. But the other thing is if I'm speaking loud enough, my neighbor, I live in New York City, a neighbor is like walking outside. They can hear me. <laughs> Right. So we have these, it's all the people who think they're in a private conversation on a phone, on the tube or in the metro, or they're walking down the street and they think nobody's listening to them. It's like, we can all hear what you're yeah, saying. Exactly. The ones I glare at all the time when they're on the train talking really loud. Those ones. Yeah. Passive aggressively. Yeah, really passive aggressively. Like. Especially, and for Brits, that's quite hard as well. We don't do that. <laughs> We're not even that good because normally we just sit there like this. That doesn't, that doesn't come over that well on a podcast. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, on, but with someone speaking on a cell phone loud in a train carriage, they get the full-on passive-aggressive, I will hold your stare yeah. until you start speaking more quietly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the quiet it's car. The quiet carriage. Get out. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> that's how I like my train rides to go. <laughs> But it's true, isn't it? There is no private speaking. I mean, what would that be? So if that's the case, then I know we're diving in really quick, but it's just that this is a really interesting concept for me, that we all get frightened of public speaking. But actually, if there's no such thing as private speaking, it's not the public speaking we're frightened of. What is it? I think it's being looked at. Okay. It's interesting. It's like looking at a mirror. <laughs> Right. So how many people love to stare at themselves in the mirror? Not very many. I mean, there are some people who really love looking at themselves, but most people, even when we're looking at a mirror or we're looking at a photograph, we always want the reflection of who we want almost others to find other people's standards, right? Like I know, like I will hold the camera a certain angle to get a certain perspective that makes me feel good about yes, myself. Always, <laughs> you know what I mean. Or when I'm looking at a mirror, I'm going to look at a distance that does not highlight the parts of myself that I don't want to see. You know, I was a stage actor for 15 years, and even for stage actors, the act we, we have to get headshots. It is torturous to go through hundreds of pictures of yourself <laughs> you know, to find, and then to post them online and say, what are your faves? And inevitably what's so interesting is the more something didn't look like me, the more I liked it. Oh, now that is interesting. Isn't it right? I was like, Oh, I love that picture. They were like, well, you look like that one. <laughs> you're like, but I don't like that one. I like that one. But you're right. We do do that because I don't, you think there's always like a tiny bit of us that's disappointed when we look at a photo or look at ourselves in the reflection. Or when, and when we hear ourselves too, I think we probably have an idea of who we are in our mind and then we're greeted with reality and not a lot of people are okay with that. <laughs> you know, I think the thing that's interesting about the stage and I think one of the things that traditionally the stage, and I'll say the stage is the public speaking, yeah. which is, me in front of people. I think that so much of our fear is connected to the beliefs that we impose upon others that we think they're thinking what we fear about ourselves. Whew. So for example, when I get up to speak in front of a group, 
like my biggest fear is people are going to think I'm not qualified. I don't belong. I don't fit in. I'm not professional. I'm too gay. (laughs) There are all these things. And then I'm in my head kind of trying to figure out, well, well, who do they want me to be and how do I perform who I think you want me to be, which is oftentimes many steps away from the truth of who I am Mm -hmm. and how powerful to have the courage. That's why I said at the beginning, it's actually so simple and so hard. How do I let go of all the presentation, the performance, and just allow myself to show up as a person to communicate the truth that I'm here to communicate in this moment. And there is something physical about the event of speaking. If I'm speaking to one person versus five versus 500 versus 5,000, it's a different energy. There's a different lift that it takes, but I don't need to be another person. No, I don't have to be a character. I don't have to be a role. And I think this is part of this idea that I love about presence that we're talking about. I think people, some people call it charisma. Some people call it luck. (laughs) Some people call it talent, right? But I think really what we're talking about is presence and there's nothing like it. I think you're absolutely right. So, so what I'm hearing is that finally getting the courage to stop performing, stop trying to second guess what someone wants you to be, or when we stop kind of tailoring ourselves almost into this fictional character that we've decided other people want us to be. That's when we can actually start being present. And when we're present, that's the key. That's the secret. That's the elixir that we're all looking for that sometimes we think only happens for other people, talented people, charismatic people, like you say. But it isn't. It's it's the authenticity, to use the overused word. Yeah, yeah. And th- there's something really powerful about w- when you see somebody who really owns that presence. What you're, like, I, I remember... I'm going to speak from the context of dance. There was a woman dancer who is in her fifties and her entire dance was an homage to her dance teacher. And she did the whole dance sitting in a chair. And it was one of the most beautiful things I've witnessed because it was all about presence, right? And if you think about like an 18 year old or a 19 year old dancer, oftentimes what it is about is hysterics, histrionics, <laughs> backflips, <laughs> all the special tricks, right? That you have to do to overperform, right? To over show off my talent. Look at all that I can do. And here's a woman who's just sitting in her chair. Yeah. And there's more dance and more movement in what she's doing and what she's not doing. There's so much dancing in her (laughs) non-dancing, right? And I think that's when we're talking about this event of speaking, if we can give up that we don't have to, the labor of pretending that we're somebody else. And if we can liberate ourselves to creating the circumstances that would allow me to be fully present with my audience, Mm -hmm. not in my head in an exercise of perfection, trying to please. I want, I want to do a good job. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? For myself, (laughs) but show up and say, I have something to offer. I know what it is that I'm talking. I'm not talking about winging it, making it up, (laughs) just showing up in front of people. It's like, I, but (laughs) you're prepared, but not from a place of control or, pleasing, but really showing up from a place of service. I just think that that's, that's where the magic lies, you know? And when you're present to it, you're like, oh, wow, this is mastery. This is, this is something else. And when you're in the show, when you're watching someone in the show, (laughs) you're sometimes just like, ugh, I'm tired. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm thinking like for my listeners who I know struggle with this. Hmm. 
the women that I work with, I tend to work predominantly with women, not exclusively, but predominantly. Mm. They really crave visibility and then they reject it at the same time. Right. So they crave it because they have something to say. They have a message that they want to get out there. But then they reject it because it's so freaking scary. It's so freaking scary to put your true thoughts out there, your your true thoughts. And it's so scary to risk looking. I think that you said something. It's like you're, people are scared of people looking at you. And that's what it is. Because what you're really scared of is people looking at you and you disappointing them, letting them down, making a fool of yourself, all of those things. That's that fundamental core, isn't it, of what people, what scares people. So how do you help? Because I know this is something you work with clients on in terms of helping people overcome that and really learning how to be confident enough to be present and to feel into it in their body. So I want to talk about confidence and then I'll talk about the other piece because it's actually really interesting. One of the things I love is etymology. So I'm a big fan of root words because what I love about language is that a word didn't exist and there was a human experience of something and then someone uttered a sound and we gave that sound meaning as a word. (laughs) And then over time, that word continues to deepen its relationship to a meaning. Now there's what the origin meaning was and then what we think it means now. And sometimes it's not the same, right? And sometimes, so, so again, from, from a word perspective, like what does this word really mean? Sometimes we're in what we think something means, which is useful. But I love going to the original source and the curiosity of, well, what is this word actually communicating and telling me? And I had a client who was at Columbia in their coaching program, and she was doing a dissertation in the paper on confidence. And we were sitting in a conference room and we were crafting a keynote around the topic. And I said, well, let's look up the etymology. What does it mean? (laughs) What is literally the word communicating to me? What is it trying to say? And the word confidence comes from the Latin and means with trust. If I don't trust myself, I will not be confident. And if I don't trust my audience, I won't be confident either. But that's this tightrope of trust. And that's what's happening in that context of speaking. If I don't trust myself, I can't show up fully present because I'm going to be in my head. Yep. Right? And if I don't trust them, then I'm not going to feel safe. So I'm not going to feel confident either. So you almost have to like, I'm trusting myself and I'm surrendering yes. <laughs> any control and allowing the belief that trust with the audience. And I think as a speaker, you're gauging that. I mean, this is what actors also do. There is that tightrope of trust, but you are in relationship with that audience in that conscious and subconscious tugging on that balance of trust so that you can be fully present with them. So you can actually speak to what they need to hear not what I prepared on the piece of paper. Like I could have prepared all night for something, but I show up with an audience and I'm like, wait a second, whatever it is that I'm saying right now is not communicating to them. I can either stick to what was on the paper or I can pivot and respond to what the moment is calling for. But I got to be able to trust myself in front of an audience to be able to do that pivot. Mm -hmm. And that is a practice. And that practice, which is what we lead our clients through, I say we're grounded in body we are present in mind, we lead from the heart, and we speak into the spirit of our shared humanity. Oh, can you say that one more time? Grounded in body, present in mind, we lead from the heart, and we speak into the spirit of our shared humanity. So people think, well, what I'm going to do is speak, like that's the first thing. (laughs) And there's all the stuff that you have to do before you speak. Yes. So, and this is it, isn't it? This is that harnessing the power of presence, which is what we've called this episode. This is the power. Correct. It is a practice. It is not a destination. And it changes depending on the audience. It changes moment by moment, right? Because the moment, this is a new moment. 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 I can learn from the past, but every moment is a moment to be present in what we do is we begin with a body because most people 
don't have a relationship to their body as an instrument, as a tool. We work the brain, but the body is divorced in relationship to speaking. And the pressure of being in front of people and whatever your history is with your safety or lack of safety (laughs) in front of people has your body in some type of reaction. For many people, the experience is fight or flight. And what you have is many people are like, I'm not feeling anything. I'm not feeling anything. I don't know what you're talking about. Meanwhile, they're not breathing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're going they're blue. Your body's like, totally. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. I'm happy. I'm feeling great. This is this is amazing. This is amazing. The best day of my life. I am overly, overly hydrating. I have to go to the bathroom every 23 seconds. But I'm fine. But I'm fine. I'm fine. I love it. I love it. So... The, the part of it is acknowledging, wait a second, I have a body and my body is having a response. And how do I slow that response? Down? Okay. Right. Right. And that is having a physical practice of preparation, which has to do with breath work and stretching and figuring out where do I carry tension in my body? Is it my shoulders? Is it my jaw? Is it my neck? Like, where am I feeling tight and contained and maybe terrified today? And how can I locate that in my body and create some room and space, right? So that's part of that physical practice because you're also channeling some of that energy. I don't know if anyone else is doing this who's listening, but I'm as you, you have such a good voice for this that as you're saying it, I can feel my shoulders dropping. Uh, I can oh, oh, oh. Right. Keep going. Length, <laughs> length. Yeah. And I mean, as I'm doing it, it gives me an awareness. I think it's something for people to note that as I was speaking about the body and connecting to where we carry tension, all of a sudden you probably started focusing thing. Oh, wait a second. I am feeling something in the back of my neck right here or in my lower back or in my legs or ooh, all of a sudden, wait a second, I am in a body. And how is, how am I checking in with my body in this moment? Not because I stretched yesterday or not because I stretched whenever, it's but the practice, the practice. Let me connect here. Let me ground into this body. And then what I what I say is, this is the present and mind piece, is acknowledge and name the fear. Mm. So people have an experience, which is, I'm panicking. I'm scattered. I'm ramped up. And I think it's important to name that experience something. Some people call it excitement, which is a beautiful reframe. <laughs> and... I think many people will experience it as fear. And I think if what we can do is say, wait a second, this fear is a teacher and it's showing up and it has something to teach me. And maybe what that feeling is connected to a thought, I'm trying to please this audience. They're not going to like me. They're going to think I'm stupid. They're going to think I'm silly. They're going to think I'm not qualified. They're going to think that I don't belong here. They're going to think that I'm too fat. They're going to think that I'm ugly. You know, they're going to, they're going to notice that, you know, I've been eating a lot of cheesecake lately. They're going to, whatever the thing is that when you actually like name it, (laughs) not because you're thinking it, but when you actually name it, you're like, that's really what's stopping me from showing up here. This probably silly, silly belief that I've been dancing with since I was like eight or nine, (laughs) you know, showing up. I'm going to let that control the moment. I'm going to let that be in the driver's seat. I don't think so. So then there's an opportunity to clear it, to name it, to clear it, just to say, okay, if, if, I, if I've named it, if I've said, okay, this is what it is, now I can distinguish it. I can choose something else. Otherwise, I'm just surviving the experience. And that's the key, isn't it? That until you name it, until you confront it, face it, look at it, you don't get the opportunity to choose something different. Correct. It's running the show. Whether you're conscious to it or not, it is running the show. There's a a beautiful acrostic for fear, which is false evidence appearing real. That's it. There's another one that someone shared me, which I really loved, which is face everything and rise. I like that as well. I haven't heard that one. Face everything and rise. And I think that that's that, that facing it. I need to face the fear. It, there's a beautiful term. My family is Cuban and of Spanish origin. And there's something called dar la cara, which is give face. Mm. 
to look at the person in the face and say the thing that you don't want to say. That's hard, <laughs> right? We avoid it. We resist it. We withhold it. <laughs> or like we people please around it. We procrastinate, all that stuff. And I think that really to grab power over it, I think to be fully present, I have to be able to make a distinction between what's going on in my brain and what's actually happening out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And that brain is trying to protect me. And fear is one of those tools, which maybe served you when you were eight or 12 or 22 or whatever, but maybe not in this moment. And the thing is the body doesn't know the difference between rational fear and irrational fear. Mm -hmm. So you swimming in a lake and all of a sudden there's like an alligator coming at you, your body's going to experience something. Yeah. <laughs> and it's gonna, that same feeling is the same one that it feels when you're standing in front of people speaking or when you have to like raise your hand at a meeting and talk out loud. I mean, the panic and the dread that people have, should I say something? Should I say not something? Say something, you know, I'm going to wait. Someone else is going to say something. Someone else. I, I don't have anything to offer in this meeting or this conversation. Meanwhile, they're like sweating because they're like, I have to ask something. I have that experience too. And the more I want the respect and validation of that community, the more I'm going to be in my feelings about it. So true. It's so true. So again, you're having a physical response. So acknowledge the body. Number two, name the fear. What is it that I'm afraid of? And then I think there's a true calibration, right? As a queer person, there are parts of the world where I would go to that are dangerous. <laughs> right? So, so that's that that evidence is real. That's not false. <laughs> that is that is real. So sometimes I have to operate or hide who are, that, that it is in my safety to protect myself. There's certain things that I'm going to say or I'm not going to say out of out of a need or sense of personal safety. Disregarding that is crazy, is insanity. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about, right? But there is, if I'm if, if I have to give a presentation, I'm walking into a room. Oftentimes, I have to calibrate this list of fears that I have because if not what happens is then I'm trying to perform who I think they want me to be and that's a disservice to me and it's also like not why they hired me <laughs> you know or not that's not why I'm there yeah so then what we talk about is crafting heart-centered content meaning that it's all about connection so I'm speaking for a purpose. And I think if we think, you know, and you, you're British and, you know, as an American, our, our educational systems are oftentimes very similar, which is lecturing. Yeah. Teachers at the front of the room. Yeah. Blah, 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 Charlie Brown. Blah, 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 blah. And you're sitting down taking notes and you can either be there or not be yeah. there. And it doesn't matter. And I think that, that that's also someone who's trying to speak to your brain. But then you'd have a teacher that like spoke to your heart. And all of a sudden you were like, this is different. You are so tuned in because I matter in this conversation. So that's, that's the piece of it that if, if you're up there as a speaker and now what I'm doing is I'm ensuring that whatever it is I'm communicating makes sense to you. Which is different to just being good at telling a story. 100%. And I think that at the moment, you know, this storytelling, which is super important, but I do think there is a disproportionate amount of focus on being a great storyteller, that people are almost trying to shoehorn a story into anything. And what we're coming out with is this, you know, a ton of kind of disingenuous shite about that aren't really true stories it's just that someone said you had to tell stories and therefore we've kind of made a story out of going to buy a banana right <laughs> whereas what you're saying is that actually the content comes first it's leading with the heart heart-led content is incredibly important. The connection is everything. Your talent as a storyteller comes next, but the content has to be heart-led. Well, because what you're, whatever you're saying doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in relationship to the audience that you are speaking to. If I haven't considered them, and they can either be there or not be there, then they're thinking, well, why the fuck am I here? <laughs> you know? And I think that there is something magical when 
you have, uh, and, and again, people think they're storytelling, but they're not storytelling. They're story dumping or they are timelining or they're talking about themselves. It's also event dumping. Well, I did this, I did this, this happened, this happened, this happened, then this happened and this happened. And, and then suddenly the audience is like, uh, and I need to know this because. Why? And the thing that I think is interesting about storytelling is we use story to extract meaning. Mm -hmm. So there is what happened. Mm -hmm. There's what happened to you or there are the events of the story. Now I, as a storyteller can piece those store, those events together in different ways mm -hmm and tell you a, a different story. Like we could have a whole room of people with the same series of events and everyone's got a different story. So there's something interesting about that. And I think that has a lot of agency for the storyteller and a lot of responsibility. Mm. But the, the point is that I put those, those events together to extract a certain meaning. Yeah. And that is what you want to be in relationship to your audience about, which is what is the meaning? What is the, what is it that I'm piecing together for them? Like, how am I putting these pieces together for them? Now, my, I believe my goal as a speaker is to put the pieces together that I think are going to afford them greater clarity around whatever message it is that I'm looking to impart. Mm. They can like it or not like it. Right. That's not on you. They can believe it or not. That is not on me. But that's because they don't have to believe it. Like I'm not sitting on any throne saying, I, I know everything about it. You're welcome to disagree, <laughs> you know, and communicate it to them. Right. And, and my job is to communicate something to an audience, ideally so that they get something out of it. Otherwise, why, why was I up there? <laughs> you know, and again, whether they agree or disagree or like it or not like it, I set an intention in communicating that to you. And it's going to resonate for the people that it's going to resonate for. And it's not going to resonate for the people that it's not going to resonate for. And that's okay. That's okay. And I think one of the things that's beautiful is that you can also leave an audience with an experience, which is like, I didn't agree with anything he said or she said, but I understand their point of view and I understand their message. I think that's a win. Oh, I completely agree with that. That is an absolute win. That's an absolute win. Right. In fact, that kind of challenging response when someone isn't necessarily leaving, you know, like, oh, bravo, bravo, absolutely agreed with every point there. I think that's actually quite exciting to leave, to divide an audience and to have someone go away and say, I really didn't agree with that, but damn, he put that across well, or damn, he's got me thinking about that now. Oh, you know, that's a real <laughs> win. I've had the privilege of working all over the world. And one of the countries that I've happened to do a little bit of work in is, is Israel. And uh, this is a broad generalization. Israelis can be very direct. <laughs> <laughs> They're not mincing words. Culturally, like Americans, as an American, Americans like to hedge and mince words. And everybody, everybody is like, that was amazing. That was awesome. extraordinary. That's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. Awesome. You know, Israeli was like, that was shit. <laughs> that was, you know, that was not good. In Britain, we're in the audience going, oh, that was nice. <laughs> that means, and in American, that means that was awesome. But in Britain, we just like to say, that was nice. <laughs> that was really, that was really nice. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that is. And the Americans offended. The Americans like, are like, ah! yeah. <laughs> You're not meeting me at my high level pitch of excitement. <laughs> but the Israelis, um, no, that was shit. <gasps> yeah. And there's a, a statistic that I often use, which is 74% of people suffer from speech anxiety and everybody else lies. <laughs> and this guy, That's good. I like that. And this guy got up and he was like, I don't experience fear at all in public speaking. And of course it was a man. And it's not, I mean, I do get women and other humans <laughs> who own that belief. And and I, what I said to them, which I, which I didn't make anything wrong with that person's reaction to it, but I love that I got a reaction out of it. That made it really alive, <laughs> you know, that I had a hot take and he had a hot response to it. And what I said to him, I said, congratulations. That is amazing that you've never experienced that and don't experience that. And I'm going to invite you as you're in this room to consider that this is something that Many people, if not the vast majority of the people in your life, maybe it's like your team, if you're a business owner, <laughs> right? Or your colleagues or your wife 
or your children or your parents deal with. And maybe there's an opportunity to wear their experience through this conversation so you can better understand where they're coming from. And was he receptive to that? He walked out. Ah. Yeah. And that was wow. okay. But that's a great example. <laughs> Thank you. That it was the present moment that was alive, that was that there. Was alive. And it wasn't the message for him in yeah. this moment. Great. Yeah. And he yeah. left. Great. Great. Yes, because it isn't the connection isn't just about agreement, is it? Connection isn't about people just worshipping every word you say. You know, it's that's not what it's about. Yeah. And then the, the last piece of it is the speaking into the spirit of our shared humanity is then getting out of the way. Gosh, I love that. Speaking into the spirit of our shared humanity and then getting out of the way. Right. That's getting out of the way. So I am connected to my body. I'm, I'm connected to my breath. I'm in this present moment. I'm not letting the fear run the show, right? But I'm actually present here, not looking at an audience and projecting onto them my fear or my shame or my doubt or my insecurity, but just like, oh, there's Mindy with a polka dot dress, <laughs> you know, and there's Stanley with a bow tie <laughs> and there's Eugene with the make hair makeover, the hair comb over. You know? <laughs> there's Sam wearing that, that unflattering color. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, but I'm just like in the moment with human, with people, yeah. with human beings, with people, just people. Present in the moment. Just people like me in this moment, right? And saying my commitment in this moment is to just really make a difference. Show up like a human being in this moment. Just make a difference. I'm going to take the fact that you're here, human beings in this room, taking time. Now, I've prepared. I've done my work, right? I'm going to take you on a journey. Let's go on that journey. And everything else is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you're speaking from your expertise. It's crafted and, and shared in a way that is intentionally there. So they understand mm -hmm. so that they get it. And the audience is like, wow, I matter being here. Or this feel, I feel so seen in this experience and this exercise that there isn't some like wall between us, but you're actually in space with me. And then you're like, that was magical. And what's interesting is the word inspire comes from the same root word as the word to speak in it, the spirit. Inspire. So, so going back to etymology, so spirit, inspire, expire, aspire, spirit. And it means with breath. Mm -hmm. When I inspire, I breathe in. When I expire, I breathe out. When I aspire, <gasps> It is with breath and spirit is with breath. Our spirit is in our breath. And when we speak, our voice rides our breath. If I had no exhale, I would have no speaking. Mm -hmm. So notice we begin the practice with connection to the body and the breath. Yeah. Right. And what I'm doing with my breath and my voice as I expire it to you, you inspire it. And now your words move me literally mm -hmm. transform me, elevate me challenge me, confront me, stimulate me, titillate me. The power of communication in communion with community, right? Not what you wrote on the piece of paper that you're trying to recall in an exercise of perfection, but actually I'm attuned one to myself and two to the audience showing up in service of them. And that's why you're there. And that's what you're doing. And that's the difference, isn't it? That last piece, you said something that really like landed with me, which was when you are showing up in that way, there's no barrier between you and the audience. You are sharing a human experience. You're not the teacher speaking down to them. You're not reciting off of a a sheet so that you have no feeling in what you're saying. You're sharing a human experience. That's the difference, isn't it? Right there. That's the difference. And so another word you used a couple of times in this conversation was letting go of the control. I don't know that feels like an important part of this, this final piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you've done that preparation work, you're present in your body. 
you're using your breath. You, you've got to the point where you're, you are ready. You're ready to, you've made the connection. Your content has the meaning. It's then about letting go of the outcome, isn't it? It's letting go of yeah. the reception. Mm-hmm. Also letting go of all of it. Uh, <laughs> right? yeah. like, yes. Like, can I let go of all of it? And because you, it, it is possible that you're up there and you're like, you know what? I have spent three days preparing for this moment. Well, three minutes, three days preparing for this presentation or whatever. And there's absolutely zero here, let's say, that truly in the moment may be resonating with my audience. Like, are you able to scrap it all and say, you know what? None of this matters right now. I'm going to pivot. Here's what I think matters right now for you. Here's what I feel you need to hear. This is what I feel needs to happen right now. Now, now you have prepared because you probably prepared a lifetime for to be able to to pivot in that moment. <laughs> right? yeah. But what happens is then the audience is just like, now we're present. Yeah. Yeah. Now our ears are up. Now our ears are up. I remember there was a moment I, I, I had the privilege of playing uh, the MC in Cabaret. Mm. And I don't know if this really happened or if I'm imagining that it happened. In my I'm head, like, it I'm really happened. Story that it, that it, Already. it really happened. It really happened. But that I was singing the opening number, Welcome and Bienvenue, Welcome. Welcome. And like somebody sneezed in the middle of it. So like, Welcome and Bienvenue, Welcome at you, Gesundheit, Fremde, Etranger, straight. But like the ability, like someone sneezes, you're like, God, like, Gesundheit, and then you keep on going into the song, right? Like that, the audience is like, What the hell just happened? There wasn't a wall. There wasn't a barrier. We were all human beings in a room and we n- witnessed this thing happen. When we are able to give up the illusion of a barrier between us, <laughs> right? It's one of the things I love about living in New York City. I'm on a subway. There's no barrier. There's no barrier. I mean, we're just all in each other's air <laughs> right? space all the time. Yeah. Like New York City, like there's no that many far, you know, it's like literally you're crashing upon people all the time, breathing things you don't want to be breathing, inhaling things you don't want to be breathing, right? But I think that that's why when we, if I can treat that moment and invite us to just be human beings together in a space, mm-hmm. virtual or in person, mm-hmm. but in a shared space together. And really allow that moment to be filled with value and meaning and connection. I mean, it feels like a reprieve. <laughs> you know, it just feels like a relief. Yes. And actually, if we, if we let ourselves make every experience of being with people or having conversations of any kind, if we let every instance of that be like that. This podcast recording, right? We could have prepared for hours and had a script and very, very set questions. But actually, I want to sit here. I want to look at you. I want to laugh at the things that are making me laugh. And I don't want to be confined to a particular conversation. And I, I guess it's a bit like that, isn't it? It's be brave enough to follow the meandering of the river. Yes. And, and together there are no straight rivers, no. <laughs> right? That is a, that is a human construction. Right. 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 It's one of those things that when, when you travel, whenever you see straight lines and right angles, that is man-made. Always. That is not Always. like squares. When you're flying over land and you're like, there are lots of boxes, there are lots of squares. That's human beings. Lots of perfect circles. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Those are just scary. That's aliens, obviously, given. <laughs> Do you know, in France, so I used to be obsessed with the tree planting in France because I have never seen trees planted in such straight lines. So that does, as you're going past in a car, 
there'll be like a, a plantation bit of trees on the on the side of the road and it doesn't matter what angle mm. you're looking at them from as you go past they all look like straight lines because they're planted so meticulously spaced it just looks like a straight line whatever angle you look at them from and that that is fascinating to me yeah an exercise in perfection an exercise in perfection yeah yeah and the crazy and it's also like an exercise in taming right because the trees don't naturally grow that way no, they don't and they're manicured and overly <laughs> meticulated you know beautiful in its structure you know but it's interesting that their nature abhors a vacuum mm-hmm. oh life finds a way <laughs> always it always finds a way and i think maybe that is the the piece as we're thinking about something to leave people with is to not be afraid of that because that's really the gold in your speaking. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, that I think that that the little weeds that are growing in the nooks and the crevices, <laughs> in the vacuums and the holes, yeah. the life that's growing that sometimes we think is unpleasant or dirty, or I would really rather not have that mess present, I think could be an interesting place to mine because we all have it as human beings. And I think that that is why when people oftentimes share of hardship or struggle, we feel relieved because we also have hardship and we also struggle. And there's a feeling sometimes that we got to perform that we've got it all put together or we know all the answers. If I see and I witness an epic disaster, like I don't want to witness that either. But I think the, I want to see the weeds I think you're right. I want to see the leaf that is growing a little askance and askew. I want to see the, like that, that, I'm curious about that. I'm curious about the one that's out of line, just an inch. I'm interested in the branch that is growing outside of the structure. Because why is it sticking out or why is it there? And I feel like that is maybe a metaphor for that part of us that we are terrified of being seen. And yet that's where all our eyes go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it may be the truth, right? I think you're right. There are like hundreds of trees that are in the stri- in formation in that line. And then there's that one little branch that's sticking out and everyone's like, you can't take your eyes off of that branch. And it's because it's not like the others. And there's, I think something real. We would also say it's off yep. <laughs> about that. Yep. And yet that is alive. And for some reason, that's the parable that we're, <laughs> that we're landing yeah, in we're in this moment. It. Exactly. What's come up for me then is in this kind of current climate we're in at the moment with AI and, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that isn't in some ways as real experientially. I think we are more and more craving the less polished the less perfect, oh, yeah. the more real. Yeah. So it makes sense, right? It makes sense of why our eyes land on the, the tree branch that's sticking out. Yeah. Because one of these is not like the other. <gasps> Sesame Street. And it, one of yeah. these things is not like <laughs> <Totally>. the other. <laughs> I love it. Because that goes back to the authenticity conversation that we had, right? Where people drop that authenticity. But I think there's an opportunity to reflect on when was it ever a good thing to be authentic? When when was it a good thing growing up to be the tree, the branch that was out a mm-hmm. little bit? Yeah. <laughs> to the God, side. Yeah, absolutely. But, but actually what we sense is conformity, not authenticity. And then yet everyone's like, be authentic, be authentic, be authentic. I and don't know like, how. Well, it wasn't safe to do that. I don't know what that means because I've been told not to say it or do it, you know, stay in that line. That's it. Yeah. And I think that that's part of that liberation, which is like, what if I can color out, I can color outside the line. Which brings us so beautifully back to what you opened with uh, um, for us, which was about that liberation of harnessing the power of presence when you're speaking. And and you have so, Mm -hmm. just so beautifully walked us through that today. And I thank you so much. What that triggered for me was the word alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I think that there is something, can I allow myself to be witnessed being fully alive in a moment? Do I have the courage? Do I trust myself? And do I trust that my audience will be okay with me being fully alive? Yes. In this moment. And when you experience it, because you get glimpses of it and glimmers of it, it's not all the time, <laughs> right? I think there's nothing like it. I think it's truly magical. And that is my wish for your listeners, that they have that experience. I wish that for them too. And for me, and for you, obviously. Tell us a bit about how your company, Fearless Communicators, how do they how do you serve your clients and how can my listeners kind of find out a bit more about you so we're a public speaking coaching business we work with people on what they say and how they say it so we work on content creation and we work on delivery and all of our work goes through that process of being grounded in body present in mind leading from the heart speaking into the spirit of our shared humanity so that is the container that holds all of our work from for our speakers And our clients have been everything from U.S. presidential candidates to U.N. diplomats to founders of tech companies to social activists, people out in the world looking to make a difference and need support getting out of the way (laughs) so they can really be the channels for that message. So we do that with individuals. We also do a program called Fearless Fire, where we work with humans on crafting like a TED Talk in six days. It's like getting shot out of a cannon. That's an exciting program. That's the one that's got me captivated. That is an exciting program. Right, because there's what you think you want to say, and then there's the truth. And can you create that container, again, to use a facilitator word, where people feel safe enough to actually say the thing that they really want to say in the way that most sounds like them? And that is liberating. So we do that program. And then we also come into organizations and teams and talk about the experience of public speaking. So the fear of public speaking, how people can master the fear of public speaking. I say hack the fear of public speaking. We also work on story and storytelling. So I think if people are really interested in learning more, they can obviously go to our website, www.fearlesscommunicators.com. And then you can also send an email to info at fearlesscommunicators.com. And then we'll also have people feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. We can put that link. I will put all of the links in the show notes for sure. And on Instagram at Stand for Fearless. So that's the best way to get a hold of me. Perfect. Well, thank you so, so much for being with me today. I find you a really calming influence on me, even though I have so many hysterical tendencies. When I listen to you talk, I kind of follow. You have such a way of talking that I follow your cadence and I find it an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I really do. So thank you so much. This was a really lovely conversation. I appreciate you. Well, thank you so much for having me and I'm honored to be here with you. See you again soon. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that getting our heads together this week has filled your mind with what's possible. If you love the show, would you do me a massive favour, please? Would you leave a five star rating on Apple Podcasts? It would really help me put more heads together, reach more ears and expand more minds. Until next week, bye for now. Bye for now.